I, I asked everyone to do one thing to prepare, which is to think about your favorite entry, just as a way to kick this off. Let me start with Anne, and is a is a writer who I know many many Dylan. We have a lot of great Dylan writers right now, but Anne uh, is absolutely one of my favorites. She teaches at the New School um, here in New York. She writes for Hot Press as well as um, she used to write for No Depression, and she she edits and authors a number of more literary endeavors in the book world. And why don't you tell us the entry of all that struck you the most? Can I have four? <laughs> sure. Yeah. I um, Honestly, uh, everyone that mentions Elvis uh, told me a little shard more about Elvis that I'd never thought of before. Um, that was something that really struck me. Um, I love the entry on Perry Como and the way he sings, but if I have to pick just one, it'll be chapter 11, Poor Little Fool, Ricky Nelson, written by Sharon Sheely. That's my pick. Okay, and, and what, what in that one, or what about, what about that song, or what did Dylan do that you particularly liked there? Well, I like his imaginative, uh, the, the manner in which he talks about these songs, which is an imaginative riff, quite often from the point of view of the the singer, the I of the song. Um, and then he has a separate section on this song. He doesn't do a separate section on all of the songs by a long shot, but he does on this one that begins, the fool has given us many songs. Many people do foolish things that are uncharacteristic of them. Maybe one small step in poor judgment can lead to a bad end, but we wouldn't call these people fools if they hadn't lived their life as one. He discusses Ricky Nelson's own life and he goes off on a riff about movies. It's kind of a microcosm of the way this whole book is structured and it's just beautifully spun and beautifully done. And he ends with Ricky Nelson attempting to reinvent himself, attempting to change his career. No more Ricky Nelson, now it's Rick. And a song called Garden Party, which is one of the great songs he ever performed. And the way that people just didn't get it. Dylan says, quote, the people who came and saw him again didn't even recognize themselves in that song. Just brilliant. Yeah. And it is representative of something I think we see a lot. Not only Bob paying tribute or calling out folks that he obviously likes and has referred to many times, but... Uh, a theme I think we'll get to today of Bob getting to say things that apply to his subject and maybe apply to himself as well. Great. Thank you. Uh, Seth Rogoboy, would it be time for you to tell us what you uh, preferred, what, what your favorite track was? Seth is the author of uh, Bob Dylan, Prophet, Mystic, Poet and uh, has a substack called Everything is Broken, uh, and there's website links on our list, and everyone's Twitter account is also on our list. Seth, why don't you tell us the, uh, the entry that struck you the hardest? Thanks, Craig. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Great. So um, it's really hard to pick just one, and as I was reading, I wasn't thinking in those terms. And the one I pick is actually... Uh, kind of stands alone. And that's not why I'm picking it, because I love what Dylan does throughout this book um, and did a great job of describing that. But the one that really kind of blew my mind when I read it and that is just sticks in my mind is the piece inspired by Edwin Starr's song, War. And the reason is because, you know, it has very little to do with the song, mm -hmm. as does a lot of the writing in this book, which I think is one of its strengths, because in a, in a large sense, Dylan takes the songs as leaping off points to discuss any variety of different issues, musical or otherwise. But the piece on war is a brilliant standalone essay on war and the history of war from ancient times until today. I mean, we know that uh, we're pretty confident that Dylan is quite a history buff. And I think whatever reading and studying he's done comes through 
in this piece, which just, uh, you know, goes through up till very recent times. He talks about the father and the son, and that's uh, George Bush one and two, um, who he never names, just calls them the father and the son, which I love. And the final line of that essay is just like a punch to the stomach, and I'll read it. If we want to see a war criminal, all we have to do is look in the mirror. And I just think that's, especially in context of what's come before, an astounding line and observation. Wonderful. Thank you. We, 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 will, we will, I'm sure, get back to that conversation. Uh, Allison Rapp joins us from Ultimate Classic Rock, and Allison wrote uh, a nice piece on this um, very early, one of the, I think, first two or three that, that made it out, um, and there's a link to that in the notes. Uh, Allison, um, why don't you share with us the entry you chose to highlight? Yeah, um, thanks for having me, by the way. It's so great to be here with all of you. This is really exciting. Um, man, it is hard to narrow it down. And like Seth said, I certainly didn't read the book with that idea in mind when I was doing it. Um, but I think if I had to pick, um, I love the section on Willie Nelson's On the Road Again. Um, like you kind of mentioned, it's one of those moments in the book where he kind of cracks the door open a little bit into you know the subject and his own life kind of mirroring one another. Um, you know, the life I love is making music with my friends. And I will kind of do the same thing Seth did, the ending line that he has there about touring just really stuck with me. Um, the thing about being on the road is that you're not bogged down by anything, not even bad news. You give pleasure to other people and you keep your grief to yourself. And I think that was just a really comforting line for a lot of people to read. Um, you know, especially now that he's on this like five year tour, especially, um, that to me just really stuck out through the whole book. I loved that section. Yeah, great. Yeah, I've been waiting for someone. I'm sure we'll see lots of things like this to collect all the lines that could be more autobiographical and compile in those into a chapter that's just Bob talking to us. You know, it's like the unredacted version or however you want to think about it. Um, David Yaffe, uh, let's, let's talk to you next. David is a professor of humanities at Syracuse. He's got a great Bob Dylan book called Like a Complete Unknown. Uh, a fantastic book on Joni Mitchell, currently working on Leonard Cohen, which will have us all back here, I'm sure, one day. And his substack is called Trouble Man, and he writes beautiful little essays about all kinds of music there. Uh, so follow that link and subscribe to that. Uh, David, thanks for joining us, and share with us the piece you've chosen. Um, well, what really excited me when I was first reading this, and I, like I guess maybe many of you, I had to read this very quickly to write it about it very quickly. And so it was with that kind of energy of uh, just saying, oh my God, like Elvis, Cust like Bob Dylan is doing what I do, or he's doing a version of what I do. He's doing a Bob Dylan version of what I do. And in fact, when I wrote the review, someone pointed out to me that I compared myself to Dylan twice, which takes balls, I know. Um, <laughs> but, but let me explain to you if I could, justify it. Uh, this is a, the, about Elvis Costello, Pump It Up. And um, when I just saw the list and I made a playlist before I could read the book, you know, I thought, gee, there are like many, because Elvis Costello has written around a thousand songs and many of them are more interesting than Pump It Up. But as soon as I saw what he was writing about it and the way I, he was writing about it, I could see exactly why he chose Pump It Up. And um, I just, this, this was just something that was so good that it made me suspicious. Okay, and I'll, I'll tell you what I mean. Uh, uh, you know, he, he doesn't do this for all the songs, but this is one of the songs where he has this one section in the second person and then another section in the third person. And I was just reading this from a writer's perspective and how well he used both of these devices. And um, the second person, of course, is, as, as all of you know, is a, is a marvelous tool as a writer because it gets you to the greatest gift of all, which is how to manipulate people and also how to tell them what to do. So the second person is great for that, but then the third person is great 
to, to tell this person's story. And it's incredible how he does both so well. So I'm just going to read a fragment from this. This is the section in the second person. Uh, you live in a world of romance and rubble, and you roam the streets at all hours of the night. You've acquired things and brought people the goods. It's not like you have a promising future. You're the alienated hero who's been taken for a ride by a quick-witted little hellcat. The hot-blooded, sex-starved wench. This kind of thing we'll get into soon, I'm sure. Uh, that you depended on so much, who failed you. You thought she was heaven and life everlasting, but she was just strong-willed and determined, turned you into a synthetic and unscrupulous per person. Now you've come to the place where you're going to blow things up, but puncture it, shoot it down. This song is in full swing, the one-two punch, the uppercut, and the wallop, and then get out quick and make tracks. You broke the commandments and cheated. Now you have to back down, capitulate, turn in your resignation. Now this is like a kind of, this is a second person reaction or a, trying to restage the song, but it's in sort of, his, he's going off in his own riff. He's not really talking about this song. He's talking about something that's inspired by the song. But now in the third person, he speaks about the song very directly. What he says about that is also rather astonishing. And it is perhaps the only time he makes a reference to one of the records. I, there might be one or two, but I think this might be the only one. Uh, pump it up as intense as and as well groomed as can be, with tender hooks and dirty looks. Heaven sent propaganda and slander that you wouldn't understand. Torture her and talk to her. Bought for her. Temperature was a rhyming scheme long before Biggie Smalls or Jay Z. Submission and transmission, pressure pin and other sin, just rattle through the song. It's relentless as all of his songs from this period are. And then he goes on about Elvis after that. But it's like. I began to suspect that there was somebody else involved in the writing of this because um, the third person is so smooth and it sounds like somebody, but I don't want to say it's a professional rock critic. I think it's just a professional writer of prose of some kind. And my suspicion was it was that guy, um, Eddie Godoreski, who did the theme time scripts. It's a similar rhythm. It's a similar choice of songs. I think there's a there's an overlap about half of the songs in this book were on theme time radio hour. Um, but anyway, I just thought everything that I love about this book is in that short section um, where you get this powerful second person writing. And, and also, this is somebody that doesn't sound at all tired. He's 81 years old and he's got all this energy on the page. Unreal. Unreal. And, you know, because when you, when you see him in person, you see him sort of accommodating age as one has to do. And he's doing it very gracefully. But when you're just writing on the page, you don't have to do that anymore. And you can have bright lights on. And uh, I mean, I, I, I swear he's he, he's so good at doing what I do that it, it made me almost sick. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was. I was uh, a crazy Elvis fan for many years. So reading that one, a song that I've heard 50 million times and hear, hearing him kind of explode it in, in new ways and get behind it was really a lot of fun. Um, I've kind of been alternating between the songs I know well in the book and the songs that I'm discovering new through the book. And it's, I think they're all interesting, interesting for us. Uh, well, I've got, I've got a bunch of other questions and I really want to encourage conversation among this group because you all know far more than I do. And as your, as your opening comments suggested, um, one of my other questions was, did Bob change your opinion of any song, any songs or which entry told you the most about a song and wasn't just background and Bob and, and this other thing? Like what was the song that you sort of wanted to dig into in a new way or, or had maybe, I think one thing Bob does is take songs that, you know, are so well known that we don't pay attention to them and puts a new spotlight on them and says, Hey, you should respect this song. It's not overplayed or whatever it is. But, uh, -huh. uh anyway, that's my open prompt here. Any, any songs that Bob got you to look at in a new or different way for anyone? I can think of two right off the bat. Um, one of them was definitely my generation. I feel like that's a song, obviously everyone's heard a million times over. Um, and I, for whatever reason, had never once in a million years ever considered the songwriting, you know, perspective as being from the opposite end. Maybe that's because 
I am a young person, so I see it from the young person's point of view or something like that. Um, but I'd never even considered flip-flopping it the other way. And I just thought it was kind of a like almost half depressing sort of thought to consider again, Bob Dylan is this 81 year old writing about what he views as an 81 year old's perspective, even though that's very obviously not the perspective that he has day in and day out, or that's not the life that he lives day in and day out. Um, that completely changed the way that I thought about that song. And then the other one um, was Witchy Woman. And I, I love the Eagles. I'm an Eagles fan fully. Um, but that was a song that, you know, over the years, especially has gotten kind of, um, maybe a little bit overplayed. It gets played a lot around Halloween. It's become kind of this like novelty-esque almost song. Um, and, you know, I had never really allowed myself to give any more depth to, to that song than I thought it maybe deserved. <laughs> um, sorry to John Henley, I guess. But, uh, you know, that just added a whole layer of depth to that particular Eagles track that I had never thought about before. Yeah. I Anyone else? Yeah, um, for me, uh, a couple of the many songs that made me really sit back on my hind legs and rethink them and listen to them again, not just in the versions that Dylan uh, re references here, but in earlier versions and other versions by other singers, um, were You Don't Know Me by Eddie Arnold. I was, I was stung and shocked by the imaginative perspective he brought to that song. And then I didn't know, I thought I knew, but I didn't know a lot of things about Eddie Arnold's life that he packs into just one short paragraph. Um, really fascinating to me, that's chapter 16. And then chapter 17 is kind of a one-two punch because the next song he discusses is Ball of Confusion by The Temptations. Um, Sure, I know it's a chaotic song. Sure, it's not one of the songs that you that you even um, want to think of in the same way that Allison was just talking about. You don't really want to think of it as one of their greatest hits. You know, you you you. It, it's a hard song to deal with. You don't want to listen to it, and he absolutely burns you down with that one. Um, a third song is the John Trudell Doesn't Hurt Anymore. Uh, yes, I knew what that song was about. Yes, I knew some of the circumstances of Trudell's life. But to have it told in Dylan's words and to have that song discussed here was, a, you know, a blowtorch, a fire hose of power and really, really important um, I've gotten emails from, you know, some of my students who never knew the song, don't know anything about it, but who like Dylan and have picked up the book. And now they want to know more about Trudell, more about what happened to him, more about his life. Um, and that's all to the good. Welcome yeah, back, great. David. Thank you. Uh, all right, uh, David Hodgdu, thank you for joining us. David wrote for The Atlantic. He's the music critic uh, at The Nation. Uh, he's on the National Council for the Humanities. Uh, and he wrote a great book uh, a number of years ago called Positively Fourth Street about uh, Bob Dylan and Joan Baez and, and, and the early crew. So uh, I'll recommend that. And again, the link is in the notes I sent out before. Uh, David, welcome. And please share with us your initial thoughts on one of the sections. Talk about uh, which is which is uh, keep my my skill uh, clean and greasy Did that for, for a number of reasons. One is um, to pick up on something everybody's already talked about the the opening section the the you know the riff on the song that's kind of like an impressionistic poetic work of really work of fiction you know inspired by the song is is superb and I those sections are my favorite parts of the whole book. Maybe we, I hope maybe we could come back and talk more about that. But then, so we have this impressionistic kind of poetic musical thing happening there. It's terrific. And then he gives us the more literal, grounded, nonfiction uh, section about the book, which is also superb. And they come together to make this great whole. And in the, in the song that's about this, the, the section is about the song and its particulars. Here's a nice uh, bit about how s music, how songs work. It's in a way that's unique from the written language. It's kind of a defense for songs as literature. You know, like uh, everybody who questions the Nobel sh should read this. You know, this uh, that the songs, 
you, you can't appreciate them by experience them only on the page. Something happens in the singing, and you know something happens. It's just it's super. It sounds like a banal point when I make it, but it's uh, it's better when he makes it. And then there's a little bit of a personal section uh, about. Uh, you know, some people, members of the audience tend to think that performers aren't such nice people or problematic people. And this song explains why it's a, it's a little bit of a nod to his, the way that he is sometimes, you know, thought of not in our world, but, you know, is sometimes described. And then for me, the best part uh, was his description of the way that that song works as a set of seemingly random snapshots seemingly random disconnected moments like uh, disconnected images that then challenge us to kind of can make connections each person makes connections in our mind and all these seemingly random things come together to form a unique whole through what the artist did and what we bring to it by listeners you know making those connections it's really quite uh, brilliant, and it's a about that song, but it's also about his aesthetic. It's about Dylan's songs, and it's about the book. <laughs> so it's essentially a thesis statement for the book. So I, I, I like that a lot. Yeah, I, I would, we're definitely going to get back to the uh, distinction and the purpose that the two different kinds of entries are the two halves of the most entries make. I think that's a fascinating uh, element of this. And and the idea that Bob's able to see something in or behind many of these songs that that most of us, and, and I think even most, most reviewers have never seen before or noticed is kind of not surprising, but pretty, pretty amazing. W what we were going on with David while you were gone is uh, asking folks for any songs that uh, where their impression had been changed or they maybe started paying attention to a song that they hadn't a lot before. And uh, Allison and Anne, I think, had had shared some with us. Uh, David or Seth, do you have any songs that weren't on a, on your hit parade before that you think will be on uh, more rotation now? Uh, well, not so much songs I hadn't thought of or I hadn't heard of, because I think like everybody here, I'm obsessed with, I mean, look, all these books are about songs. You know, so, uh, so I really care about sounds like all of us. It's not so much that, but his ideas about the songs and his idea about his ideas about life in the world that are inspired by, by the songs and sometimes very, very rich and sometimes provocative, sometimes unsettling, uh, but sometimes really illuminating. Like the, this, the chapter on Money Honey. It's just a superb essay on economics. Mm -hmm. And I don't really, I'm not really comfortable with money. I don't, mm -hmm. you know, understand money. But here I was in the hands of someone who really understands money. You know, he's writing about something he clearly cares about. And I don't say that in a negative way, you know, but he, there's authority and expertise. Uh, in that chapter, and I, you know, I learned something about economics from it. And there are quite a few other chapters like that. But for me, it was more learning something about the songs than discovering the songs, the song, personally. I'll tell you, a song that I've been haunted by since reading the book is Detroit City. I've been haunted by the storytelling and the imagery it's so simple, but the imagery really is vivid, and at least in my mind, and I think in other people's minds too. Uh, you know, at, at, by day I make the cars, at night I make I, I make the bars. Such mm -hmm. simple words, and you, you get an image of exactly what that means, how it feels, day in and day out. And, and you're like, I mean, it was a song that I knew, but I hadn't really thought about it in the same way since I'd read what he what he wrote about it but the other thing i wanted to pick up on was something was from allison because um because allison talked about witchy woman and and um the section on witchy woman is the elephant in the room really i was just rereading it last night and i was like jesus christ <laughs> i mean it is really something um 
there is there is a reviewer who's not here, uh, Jody Rosen, who accused Bob Dylan of being a misogynist and used things from that section and other sections as, as evidence for Dylan's hatred for half of the human race. And, uh, you know, we have two women here who I would rather speak about this before I said anything about it. But uh, certainly rereading it last night, it made me uncomfortable. And uh, so let's yeah. <laughs> that that is that this is this is on our agenda, but as a topic that may go a little sideways and and get out there, I want to defer that one if you don't mind for for a little while. Um, mm-hmm. But but it's definitely something we're going to get into the Jody Rosen review. The I think there's been four reviews that have made a very large point of uh, this of this idea. Um, so so we we're we're definitely going to get back to that. But I'm gonna I'm gonna stop that one there because I'm afraid it's going to take up our whole hour once we. <laughs> once, once we begin, uh, Seth, did you want to uh, add something that changed its perspective for you after reading? Well, I wouldn't say that it changed my perspective, but he did write about either a few, um, well, probably a number of um, performers who I was not familiar with, obviously a number of songs that I was not familiar with um, or that, you know, I would have never given a second thought to. For example, you know, Perry Como. For some reason in my mind, that name before I read the, that chapter is kind of a joke. TV singer, you know. Then he makes the claim, quote, that he could outsing anybody. So I listened to the song that he attached Perry Como to. He's absolutely right. It was amazing. What a great voice this guy had. Um, you know, and, and I think he puts him out there in other singers of pop stan- pre-rock pop standards and somewhat makes the case that he could outsing them is, is really what the point is. Um other things were, you know, I had never heard of Jimmy Wages and didn't know the song Take Me From This Garden of e- Evil, which is an incredible song. Um, this guy was a, uh, you know, contemporary of Elvis Presley. And it just kind of blew my mind listening to that song and that and Jimmy Wages sing it, that, that there was somebody who I also believe he says, and I don't know if this is true, you know, grew up, lived down the block from Elvis or something. And he he's doing exactly the same thing that Elvis was doing at the exact same time. So that, you know, we know Elvis, but of course it never occurred to me that there were other Elvises that just never got known and big the way Elvis did. And, um, you know, another another name that when I whenever I heard it, I would not have any good association with. I don't know why, but Rosemary Clooney, you know, you would say that to me and I would say, you know, I would I would certainly uh, raise my eyebrows as I'm doing. But this song, Come On to My House, her version of that, which is from 1951. So again, talking pre-Elvis, pre, pre-rock and roll, really. I mean, you know, there's obviously, there was a lot going on in R&B and, uh, and country music and leading up to that. But that's her rendition of that song rocks as hard as anything Elvis did. And I had no idea that she sang that way and and again, of course, there would be music be, like with Jimmy Wages, but even before then, that would point to. And, and, and the final one, and I don't know if any, any of you else felt it, is the song Volare, which, of course, I only knew, I think, as a TV commercial. Didn't they use that decades ago? Yeah. You would hear it all the time in a TV commercial. And, and Dylan writes, this could have been one of the first hallucinogenic songs predating Jefferson Airplane's White Rabbit. 
by yeah. at least 10 years, which, so, of course, that never occurred to me. Uh, uh, so, so those are the ones that really stood out as uh, yeah. surprises or, or, or uh, as you say, reevaluations. Yeah. And go ahead. Can I, can I just say something about the Perry Como? Because that was a big curveball to me, too. And I went back through and took a look at the kind of other things Como was recording, his other albums, um, what would have been available when, you know, Dylan was a kid growing up for him to listen to. And I came across an interview that Al Cooper gave um, about almost 10 years ago where Coop says, quote, my father bought me a Perry Como album when I was very young, and it had songs of faith on it. He sang Eli Eli and Kol Nidra with a gigantic orchestra and chorus, nothing you could hear in services. This moved me tremendously, and I mean, to this day, I can listen to it because his singing is fabulous. He sang in Hebrew, and he pronounced all the words. To this day, it's phenomenal. Every year at the new year, I would drag that album out and play it. So, you know, I can't, I honestly can't think of any other big stars who were doing things like that and having an effect on a kid like Coop and who knows what other kids um, with, with that kind of music that, that seems like it doesn't have a place in the Great American Songbook to some people, but to Perry Como it did, and he put it right there, and he ran with it. But with that uh, another of... singer who did that sort of thing, who, who drew from that repertoire, was Johnny Mathis, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. yeah. Without a Song is a great jazz standard, and uh, if you want to hear a very powerful version, uh, Sonny Rollins recorded a version of it right after 9-11, and he wasn't sure if he should even go on stage because 9-11 had just happened. And he was in Boston, and uh, the people were there, and they wanted to hear the music anyway. And so then he came out and he said something. He had to say something, but the thing that he really had to say was in his version of "Without a Song," and that said everything that needed to be said. Yeah. So it's such a powerful and beautiful song. And uh, if you think about like measuring up to that kind of loss in that moment what Sonny Rollins as a musician could deliver with that song. It's, it's so powerful. And so I always think of that song and, and, and the, the elasticity of it uh, because it's a great jazz standard. You know, and of course it's usually associated with Sinatra who recorded it memorably with, with Tommy Dorsey and then redid uh, in the sixties on his reprise album. I, I remember Ta Tommy in a very, mm -hmm. in a very deep penetrating, uh, rendition it's, it's it's different from 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 como it's, it's not as it's very uh uh very powerful i just wanted to uh, give a, a shout out to the late terry teachout who wow. who wrote beautifully about perry como when no no one else was doing it and no one else was very powerfully about perry como no one else was really taking it seriously and it, it was kind of uh, uh, made fearless arguments about uh, Como's yeah. legitimous importance. Importance. Yeah. yeah. One of the one of the great things Bob seems to do in this book, and really in all of Bob, is is not fall into um, preconceptions and and snapshots and kind of make his own decision. And I think he, it is interesting in this book how he somehow came at all these songs very fresh and from every possible angle. It, it, maybe that has to do with other people, you know, sharing their perspectives and this being somewhat of an assimilation. And, and we'll talk about that, but it, it's blowing sure away that. old stereotypes is, a, is certainly a, an impressive thing that, that happens in here. Um, yeah. I, I want to talk for a minute about the format of the book and this, the duality of these, uh, you know, kind of impressionistic and more realistic two sections. I'll throw out one small idea and then I want to hear from from you how, how they struck you and I, most many of you reference that in your in your reviews but it, it's a really interesting approach to a difficult subject and a subject that could have been many people could do this badly in a lot of ways my take on it I tweeted this morning a picture of that furry faced guy from the 65 press conference who asked him about the philosophy of the triumph t-shirt <laughs> and what it made me think of is that he's he seems to be recreating the 
philosophy of the song, meaning the song feels like this. And he does a piece of writing that feels like the song, even if it's not talking about the song, evoking it or something in some way. And then he writes this almost like a different person wrote a, taking a very different approach, wrote the, the second essay. As you guys were reading and digesting in a, in a deeper fashion, share some thoughts. Maybe, maybe Allison, why don't I ask you to start so we have some order here. H how did you think about the two pieces? Sometimes there's only one. Sometimes they, they play off each other in interesting ways. But what were your thoughts on that style? Yeah, even that is a very Bob thing to do to not be consistent in the structure of it through the entire book, definitely. I was maybe thinking of it through a pretty theatrical lens. I mean, that was how they kind of read to me. Maybe that also has something to do with the fact that I, I finally saw a girl from the North Country this year. So I was kind of thinking already in that lens of how Bob's work tends to translate on the live stage, whether it's a concert or if it's an actual, you know, written stage play. Um, so I was thinking about it kind of in those lenses. And there's actually a really good essay in that book that came out last year. Um, oh my gosh, what is it called? Um, the World of Bob Dylan, Damian Carter does a good um, essay and they're talking specifically about how theater has influenced Bob's work over the years and vice versa and how that kind of plays a role. So that's how I was thinking about it. But I also could hear, you know, some tarantula-esque, you know, syntax going on in a lot of this, um, which I loved that kind of like rapid fire stream of consciousness. You better keep up. Or otherwise, you know, I'm going to keep I'm going to keep going. And then, like you said, you know, reaching the second point where he almost kind of like takes a step back, takes a breath and goes, OK, now here's the story. Um, so it, it was this, you know, really overwhelming mixture to me of like half film noir, half yeah. Sam Shepard stage play, half yeah. tarantula um, mess kind of going on. And yet at the end of it, you know, you're 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 at a new place. David Hodge, do was there, is. Uh, amongst all those books, is there a, another person who's attacked music writing in this way that, that it, this brought you, that made you think of? No. No. <laughs> no. I mean, no. <laughs> there are people who attack music writing as Dylan does in the lucid, relatively conventional sections on the song history and uh, the construction of the song, the you know, analysis of the, of the, of the work musicologically and, and culturally. There are you know, a lot of people who do that. You know, we, I think we all do. We all do that. And, and I think Jeffrey O'Brien in, in, in particular. And it, uh, but not the really impressionistic stuff that, as I said earlier, is my is my favorite. That's the most literary material in in the book, and I, I would love to see. I would love to have seen a book. Well, I'm not. I'm not going to. I was just about to say just that, but this works wonderfully because of this juxtaposition, you know, and the clashes between the elements sometimes, as well as the fact that sometimes they work in a complementary way. But agree. Agree. And I mean, it's uh, it's just to follow on to that and also to what Allison said, it's yeah, it's it's very tarantula esque uh, without the sign offs. But what it is also are the three he shouts out in Key West, Ginsburg, Corso and Kerouac. I mean, oh. that's that's what it that's what these these riffs i think that's the right word for them that's the word that the publisher uses in the in all the promo material it's the word that i think dylan himself has used uh these riffs these impressionistic riffs are um quite often from the point of view of the speaker this really strong eye which is something dylan too has been cursed with throughout his songwriting career having this really strong I and everybody says, oh, that's Bob Dylan singing. That's Dylan's point of view every time he drops an I into a song. Um, you know, yeah, say that about Byron and the Romantics as well, or, or anyone else who writes from the first person in a work of fiction, which is what it is. Um, mm -hmm. but, but absolutely the influence of the beats, um, of course, on Tarantula, but I think skipping over Tarantula and Dylan today, just going straight back, to, to the beats he likes best and his work he knows best is uh, absolutely dripping from this book. Uh, Seth, Seth, go ahead, I interrupted you. I wanted to just pick up on a, on a point that Al I'm so glad Allison made. Now, I think there's a lot to be said about these riffs. And in my review, in particular for the forward, I talked about the kind of Talmudic or biblical midrash 
But putting all that aside for a second, I want to, the other thing that really struck me, Allison, you talked about the theatricality and what, what over the, the accumulation of reading these things, it occurred to me that if there is a method acting version of um, music criticism or approaching a song, uh, really, that, that in a way that's what Dylan was doing with the songs. In other words, you know, in method acting, you have the playwright's text, you have the exact words, but you're supposed to go back and dig deep into the, you know, the emotional memory of the character and where did all this come from and create this whole backstory. This is exactly what Dylan is doing um, in, you know, in a deep, profound way. So, so I would call it, uh, you know, uh, method singing or method uh, musical criticism. And, and it's also, it struck me that what a, this must be a way that Dylan and maybe other singers um, approach songs that they didn't write. Um, songs that they might want to cover or, or sing a version of, you know, I suppose you could just do that with with the lyrics and and not go beyond that. But but you can also see how much more you could bring to the song if you do what Dylan is doing in these riffs, where yeah. you know so much more about the narrator and the backstory behind the lyrics. So that's what really struck me about. Well, many things struck yeah. me, but that's one. But yeah. If I could add to that, I know yeah. something specific about Sinatra's method that speaks to the point that Seth just made. He, in concerts, he, he often began with a little story about the song that was his way of working into the world of the song. For instance, on Sending the Clowns, he would say, this is the story of a, of a couple. They've been together a long time. And one of them splits the scene, splits the coup, and the other has to live with it. Well, no, it's not. Oh. It's, it's, it's oh. not what it's about at all. But he found, but he created this, can create it, imagine this thing as a way for him to get into it. And of course, you know, we know that Dylan thinks, has thought a lot about Sinatra. And, and you know, he's doing, I think, something of the same thing. That's a very good point. I want to just respond to something that Allison said because I love the way you put that and I love the references that you make because those references are perfect. And I just want to link that to the title of this book, which I think is editorial hyperbole. I don't really think Dylan meant to write a philosophy of anything. I think that if Dylan had written a book of philosophy, it would have been a lot less fun.